Welcome, welcome. And if you're just joining, uh, we're, we're about to get started. The, the question I posed in the chat was, uh, feel free to say hello, tell us where you're, you're joining from and uh, whether you are or not about to get hit by a hurricane. Uh, I hope not. Um, I hope there's no inclement. I see a lot of people from all over the place. That makes me very happy. We're going to have a fun, fun conversation. Uh, I think we can go ahead and get started. Uh, but yeah, thank you again for, for joining. I am thrilled. Uh, I'm going to switch over to uh, the deck. So just know I'm not going to see the, I'm not going to be able to see the chat, uh, but I will switch back over and then uh, we'll go through the, the questions in the chat. Oh, there we go. I will mute that. Uh, we'll, we'll go through any of the uh, questions in the chat. We'll have discussions. Don't worry. Uh, you're going to get this deck. I've got a link on there. We're going to have a lot of fun. So let's go ahead and get started. So, so this session is about a whole bunch of CSAT, AI, all of the fun stuff. Before we get into that, let me tell you who I am. Uh, I am Sam Chandler. I am with Zendesk, uh, but I am a lifelong connoisseur of customer service, customer experience, uh, startups, and uh, apparently Red Bull. So those are the things that you really should know about me. All of this session is going to be powered by Red Bull as an FYI. Um, and yeah, I, I have found myself in startups. I found myself working not only with startups, but, but companies all across the, the spectrum from, from, you know, one to two seat companies all the way up to, you know, thousand person, uh, and, and plus enterprise organizations. So it's been, it's been really interesting to see, you know, the, the differences and the similarities across CX, across across just business, taking care of, of your people uh, across that spectrum. Uh, the, the the two things I always love to talk about startups and, and what I see emerging, uh, because we get to see all of those trends about a, at least two years before the rest of the market does. Uh, we saw crypto first. We saw, what else did we see first? Uh, I mean, AI, really. So what I'm seeing right now that I love creator economies are very fascinating to me. Uh, I'm already seeing a lot in terms of like influencer marketing, influencer account management, and all of these really interesting revenue streams that are popping up for creators. So I think that's pretty cool. And then also I think the the new fintechs that I'm seeing are pretty cool. I'm seeing a lot of, uh, of companies that are really focused on building generational wealth, which makes me happy. So that's a little bit about me. Uh, also obsessed with movies, television, and baking along with the Red Bull. So now that you know that, let's get on to the, the fun stuff. Uh, I thought it would be prudent to start this conversation, not only with a Jay-Z reference, that's important, but also it's it would be really easy to to just go into AI. I'm sure that, that that's really on your brain right now, but I want to, I want to kind of take it back before we do that and talk about why we're doing any of this. You know, what, why do you have product fit and, and you know, what, what separates you from somebody that just has a really cool idea? Uh, and so usually I have people uh, ask in the chat, I can't see the chat right now. So just in your mind or feel free, throw it in the chat, but any ideas you have about that. And uh, I'll go ahead and tell you the difference is customers. Uh, when you don't have customers, that's when you know you just had a really good idea. So I want you to think about that as we're talking about product market fit, as we're talking about customer satisfaction, how those two fit together, and also what the hell AI has to do with any of it. So I, I know that, you know, this, th this summit is about fundraising and AI, but I also want to point out that regardless of how you grow your companies, customers are how you're going to get there. <laughs> Whether you're bootstrapped, I mean, I think that's pretty obvious, but investors, especially in, in this climate, uh, they, they want to know that you have a viable business model. So it's important to, to make sure that you are building something that is for 
some kind of market. I don't care who that is, but you need to make sure that you have that in mind uh, because you I know your investors will. I've talked to them. So they told me they do. Um, and then I, I also like to bring it back. This uh, this report is from a, a couple of years ago. Uh, this is the top 20 reasons that startups fail. I know it's not surprising to see no market need at the top by a whole lot, but I also want to point out all of the other reasons that are related not only to product market fit, but also to customer experience. So the, I, I've separated them out by, by green and orange arrows, but what's really fascinating is that the, the reasons are, are pretty similar uh, for not having a direct line to your product market fit, but also not having a direct line to your customer experience. So that's why it is so important, especially in the early days, you don't have a sales team to sell somebody on a dream. The product is the dream. So uh, getting that right is is super key. And your customers, trust me, they're they're going to tell you. They are telling you whether or not you've got that right. So uh, the reason two, uh, again, just to reiterate the the way this connects back into fundraising is that the, the investors that you're talking to are looking for. Uh, revenue growth and CAC to, L uh, to, to LT, uh, but they're looking for that as an indicator of your product market fit and your customer satisfaction so that they can determine your traction, your scalability, and whether you have a competitive advantage. So um, today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, how you can do that, how you can, how you can test that out yourselves very, very easily. Uh, and also how you can show that. Doing and showing, two very, very important things. And I, I like to kind of start here. It, you know, we think of, uh, well, a lot of the people I talk to, they, they think of customer satisfaction data or CSAT, as we call it in the industry. They think of it as a score. You know, you send out a survey, how well do we do on this transaction? You get a score. And a lot of times uh, I, I talk to startups that that is what they that's what they report. That's what they they show me. That's what they show investors. And they're they're like, <laughs> we got a 95% CSAT. We're amazing. And I'm like, well, that's cool, but like, let's break that down. What is what did that come from? What are you what are you doing to get that? Uh, what happened to the other five percent? You know, all of these these questions are wrapped up in that. And so uh CSAT ratings are are cool, but there's more to it. And for me, I love to focus on a focus on text analysis. I'll get into that in a minute, but I, I want to point out that if you do this, not only will you be able to capture a, a market and understand your, your fit in that market and whether you need to pivot, but you'll also be able to hone in on patterns. Pattern recognition is huge. It's huge for honestly a lot of different fields, but especially for a founder. Anybody, anybody in in uh, the the world of business, you need to understand patterns so that you can start following them and understanding what your competitors are not. So the more that you can show that to a a potential investor, you are setting yourself apart from trust me because I've talked to ninety five percent of founders out there who are not doing that. The more that you can show that that customer story, both individually and and your kind of your your aggregate, it's it's gonna make you look so pro. So this is why it's important. Um, three easy things to it: uh, knowing your product, knowing your market, and then being able to extrapolate that with AI. Again. I know a lot of folks, they're just like, oh, AI at it. It's fine. Just put it into chat GPT. You spit out your business plan. You're good. You're golden. I don't like to start that way. Um, I like to, to dig into the data a little bit myself so that I understand what it is that I'm looking for. So we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about it from that perspective. Uh, and I, just so you know, I did almost write these as, as Drake lyrics of, one knowing yourself, two knowing your worth, and I was like, I can't, I can't be that nerdy, but I can be nerdy enough to put, uh, to put them on there. And I will say, if Drake had done a little bit of text analysis, he probably would not have gotten into that beef with Kendrick Lamar this summer. Just saying. Anyway, um, first things first, we're gonna start with uh, knowing your product. 
it's important that first and foremost, you understand what it is that, that you are selling, how it's being received, and all the things in between. Uh, I do this through a little thing that I call CSAT whispering. And I call it that because I am a nerd. But really all you're doing, you are just looking at the comments uh, that, that you are gleaning, that you're capturing from your customers. And so I've put a couple of different ways to do this because I know that that we're at different phases of our of our, our product journey, of our founder journey. But uh, if you have any kind of feedback at all from anywhere, you're going to be able to, to do this well. And again, I know that this is a little bit of an eye chart on the right hand side. I put these in here because these are examples of, of ones that I've done. And I want you to be able to see this when you get this deck. So you, you're you going to be able to zoom in. But those are real life examples we'll talk about. Uh, the easiest way to do this is if you have a, a customer survey that you send out. It doesn't have to be a CSAT survey after every transaction. It could be um, something like a net promoter score. How likely are you to recommend us? Uh, if you sent out a survey just asking how you're doing or if you've gathered anything like that, this totally counts. But what you're going to do, I like to, to, if you have a recurring survey that goes out, I like to capture the last 30 days. You can do more than that, but since we're doing this manually, trust me, you're going to be able to tell really quickly. 30 days is a, is a pretty good uh, starting point. And by the way, it also does not matter what the score was. So I don't care if it's a good CSAT, a bad CSAT, put it all in there. And I'm going to show you uh, an example of why in a minute. But basically what you're doing is, again, this is very lo-fi. You, I like to do this with a piece of paper, again, because I'm a nerd. But uh, uh, I just literally make buckets. I go through, I read the comments, and I make buckets of these topics. And so when I come across a new topic, I'll add a new bucket. But when I see the same bucket, I will add a tally, a point in, in that field, in that column. And so as you read through, you will get a pretty good of what you're doing well and what you're doing not well. Uh, my favorite thing about that is when people give a good, <laughs> a good score and they write a terrible terrible comment about how poorly you're doing and vice versa. That's always really fun. Uh, but yeah, if you if you don't have a survey that goes out, it's fine. You have plenty of other ways that you can capture this. If you have any kind of support ticket or really any communication channel with a customer will also work. You're basically going to do the exact same thing as, as uh, with surveys. You're just, just going to need a, a place to compile all of the all of the interactions that you've had. So, um, so again, it's, it, you know, same process. And then let's say you're like, well, Sam, I don't have any of those either. You know, if you have any reviews at all, anywhere on the internet, anywhere in person, Reddit, Trustpilot, G2, wherever you want, get creative. If someone has given you feedback, you can, you can still do this exercise. Uh, and just remember, if you have a, a comment that has multiple sentiments, it's not about good or bad. It's not about assigning like, was this a good interaction or not? Don't worry about any of that. This is about product market fit. So you're trying to glean all of the details you can. And it doesn't matter if you are assigning a sentiment, good or bad. You just want to capture them all so you can get maximum impact. And again, on the right hand side, this is a legit real life CSAT whispering exercise that I did with a customer uh, I consulted a, a few years. I won't say who but they had physical product. So that rating that uh, that is down towards the bottom of that second slide, that was actually a, a legitimate um, rating that they got in in uh, in product or like I guess in their in their survey about somebody that had purchased something somewhere else because they couldn't they couldn't figure it out in this person's store. So if you think about that and you think about one lost sale and how much the the other eight were worth for the people uh, that said that that they were going somewhere else. If you look at the the dislikes above, one of the main buckets that I saw in their dislikes field was lost sales. Like, think about how much money you're losing there. So again, knowing why people like you and also dislike you, like what what is bad about the experience, both really really important, and you can tie that back to to revenue uh, and growth. So again, uh, feel free to give me a holler if you if you have any questions about this process. Um, 
I could nerd, nerd out about this for days and I generally do. But uh, but yeah, again, it, it becomes very easy to really understand what are your top like what what are your your superpowers? Uh, what do people love about you or your experience or what do they don't? What do they not like? And then you can fix those. So once you have a better understanding of what you are doing well, you need to now understand the market. It's one thing to know your piece of it. That's cool. That's really important. But a founder needs to know everything. So this is where this is where I like to do a little bit of market whispering. Uh, I go to any place, <laughs> any place that I can think of that my competitor might be. And I take a look at their reviews. So it depends on what your product is, what your service is. Th this could be anywhere. Um, I have a, a real world example here and I blocked out all of the names to protect the innocent, but I went onto the Apple app store and I was like, okay, I will say this was a food service, a food delivery service. And I was like, I wonder what the ratings are for all the other food delivery services, uh, out there on the market. And, you know, where are they versus where, where was my client? And it was really interesting because. Because again, you can't see the specifics because this is super tiny, but you'll be able to zoom in. Uh, just know that when we play, when we played this game of guess the rating, uh, the 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 comments and the reviews from the app store that were the highest were actually like the like the the best in sentiment were actually rated the lowest and vice versa. It was really fun, uh, and then uh, we realized at kind of at the end of this exercise that everybody was really within the same range. So again, that's another point to remember is that this satisfaction element, like a CSAT survey is not the end all be all. And that is why you shouldn't just be using that for your, your, your investments or for your, for your in, investor pitches. Uh, you, you've got to show something else. You've got to show why, because all your all your competitors are doing that exact same thing. So if that's not the differentiator in the market, then you got to find something else. So that's the first thing. What is your addressable market saying about your competitors? So if the app store is not where you're going to find it, think about all the other places. Trustpilot is uh, is a really great one for me or G2. Um, you know, in the in the SaaS space, uh, you can find uh, a lot of a lot of our competitors, but I will tell you that just being a part of, of communities online. So, you know, me being in CX, I'm a part of several uh, su support communities and, and customer experience communities. I, I go in with an open mind, but it's so fascinating to see how just regular everyday CX managers talk about your product. And it's like, oh, this is very fascinating that this is our reputation in the market. You can do the same thing. Uh, don't be a salesperson. Don't do anything like that. Just listen to what's being said about you, about your competitors. And uh, and yeah, after you you kind of have that understanding. Also, it can be in person. Uh, I go to a lot of conferences and I I hear the way that that, you know, customers talk about Zendesk versus our competitors. And I'm like, oh, very fascinating, especially at different points in their journey points uh, like in, in their, their, you know, size or, or, you know, who they're serving. It's super, super interesting. So once you, once you understand that uh, you can figure out which, which one of these components that people are saying they like and don't like are leading them to leave or, or stay and make purchases. It's really interesting also to see what people complain about versus what makes them leave. Uh, I'm not saying that you should ignore the reasons that, that they're saying that they're upset. You should fix those. But if you see a driver of loyalty that is either being dismissed by your competitors or you, <laughs> or you're seeing uh, something that like no one is addressing, there's your value prop right there. That's how you differentiate. And so that's what you where you can take this this market analysis and you can make your own differentiator. This is how you can disrupt. Or if you realize, oh shit, I'm not doing that either, then uh you can say, there we go. Then you can say, okay, well I need to pivot. I need to fix this, whether that's product or service or whatever the case may be. 
So once you've started doing all of that, for me personally, that's when I put on the AI piece of it. Because let's think about this. LLMs, large language models, they're great. That This is amazing. We're able to, to extrapolate so much more information than what we have ever been able to do manually. But if you don't know what you were looking for, what are you doing? Like you, you might just be going off on this crazy thread because AI doesn't quite understand that when your customers use a certain phrase, what they're really talking about, or maybe AI understands, but you don't. So in my opinion, it's really important to start with you doing the exercise. You're not going to be able to, to expand on it and scale it, but that's what AI is for. So I'm always an advocate, make sure you know what you're doing and then put in AI. Uh, I've, I've added in uh, a few ways of easing into this. And then also, you know, for, for tech folks that are, are way more advanced than I am in terms of your ability to, to build things, you should go build things. So, oh, sorry, my, uh, my IT team, they pushed a, a Slack update and like, it's literally blinking at me. Sorry if that, if that messed anything up. But anyway, uh, the first place that I would start in terms of adding AI to your, uh, to your, your, your business processes. Uh, if you have tools for customer communications, so I'm going to use an example from Zendesk because it's the one I know best, but we have AI built into not only our processes, which are, are pretty cool, but also into our reporting. So for me, that would be an easy way to start. Uh, I would think of categorization. I think back to when I was a, an, an admin, like a support manager, and I had to create what we, we call them about fields. And that basically means like the field on your ticket form that you, uh, that you create, so you can go and say what this ticket was about. It's so fun. Um, not because it's a lot of maintenance because your, your reasons are changing all the time. They can change from week to week. Like what happens if you had an outage and you were like, okay, well, <laughs> that's not going to be a thing next week. Or wait, I, I don't have a field for outage. I need to get one really quickly. And then you're missing a whole bunch of tickets and, and the ability to categorize off of those. So AI has really changed the game with that and being able to, to surface all of those details. That is what I would recommend. Uh, just if you're if you're starting out, if you have some kind of communication tool that, that you're leveraging to talk to customers, use that, see what you can pull from there. I guarantee you that they have some kind of AI component. Uh, trust me, I just drove uh, from downtown San Francisco to the airport and I saw all of the AI billboards for everything. So I guarantee you the tools you're using, they have AI. The other thing that you can use, especially if you don't yet have a like a fancy system of uh, of like collecting survey data and stuff like that, you don't need it. It's okay. All you need are all of the the comments that uh, that you gleaned, all of the communications that that text. Use an off the rack uh, AI tool that's already on the market. There are so many free ones. I mean, if you want to use ChatGPT for something useful, feel free to use that. Uh, but also there are a lot of tools. Some of them are in beta. So for example, Google has Notebook LM. That is, I believe, in beta. There's also a lot of extenders or I'm sorry, extensions uh, like TLDR this, where you know you can just grab it and get a summary. Uh, Quillbot. Those are generally used for summarizing books and text and really long research papers, but you can use it for this too. Isn't that cool? Uh, and then also, it, depending on what you need for your uh, for your business, it might make sense to just invest in an AI tool that does kind of other things. So uh, Jasper AI is one of our customers. So I think of them, but also Grammarly has some really interesting things coming out that kind of attach to their their standard product, uh, Claude AI, and and I, I think it, you say it, Kagi, KG. I don't know how to say it, and please tell me in the in the chat if you know. But but these are these are things that yes, they are paid. But if you see value in other parts of your organization, it could be helpful. 
Uh, and then again, if you know how to build your own model, you should do that. <laughs> you should do that and you should sell it because the, the really cool thing about LLMs is that they're the most useful when they're contextual around your data. And again, I'm going to use the Zendesk example because it's what I know best. But if you think about like the reason that that our our AI products are are powerful is because we have been able to build it around CX and we've taken all of the millions at this point support tickets that we have. And our LLMs are literally based around CX and and that type of context. So you can do the same thing. And it's going to help you as you're building, like basically as you're determining what is special about your product or what you need to make special or what you need to pivot, knowing your own industry, understanding those uh, very specific details, that metadata is going to be key. And then, like I said, then you have your own, your own product that I guarantee you people will buy. Um, so yeah, those are pretty much, um, that's pretty much the basics before. Before I go over to the, the chat and see what question has, I'm going to throw this up here again. This is the, this is the deck. Feel free to, to grab that. Uh, it's my LinkedIn and that's my email address. So you're more than welcome to reach out to me. And yeah, I think I can Let me move over back here. Um, all right. We have a couple of minutes and I, I've got a couple minutes after that. So if we if we want to stay on, I have a couple minutes to do that. Let me read through some of these. I'll go, I'll start with the QA. Um, any suggestions for recorded customer interviews to text? There are some, I don't have a favorite. I don't have a favorite tool, Scott, but I there are some on the market. What I can do, if you if you find me after this, I will get back with you with some of my colleagues and their favorites. Um I do not have a, a favorite. I know that like uh, we we have used Gong at, at our company. It's that's I, I probably have the best feedback about that, but I'll go back to you and see if there's any more. I notice most surveys tend to be anonymous, but I'm considering linking surveys to user accounts. Ooh, doing so could provide advantages like the ability to segment feedback and gain deeper insights. However, I rarely see this approach being used. Is there a reason? Oh, Ryan, there's so many interesting facets to that. I will say that you're probably going to get more responses if you have an anonymous element. But the fun part about that, as I think your, your question is alluding to, is the fact that you're not going to be able to get back to anybody if you want to address their feedback. That happens sometimes uh, at our organization. And I will say that Zendesk, as far as I know, we try to only use um, like a, a, with your name attached or, or having the ability to at least add your name. So I would say that, well, there's also companies like Medallion. Like I will say that there are elements of, of especially enterprise organizations that do use kind of anonymized data like that. <sighs> I don't want to say it, I, I primarily see it for market research, but I would say that that's probably the best time to use like that anonymized data. But if you want to link it to your own um, account, I see that all the time. Like if I think about the way that Zendesk's process works, it's attached to the ticket, which is attached to the, the user. So there's merits in both. It depends on what you want to do, but I think I think you're good to go there. Um, Rashan, can AI be used to predict future customer behavior and identify potential product gaps or opportunities use that data? Yes. I love that you're thinking that. Uh, again, I don't want to make this like a Zendesk thing. So just know that that's just the tool that I know best, but I'll give you an example. We have, uh, we have sentiment analysis and that's like an AI feature that's, that's built in to the product. So basically what you're able to do from there is capture uh, the context of all of that user's tickets uh, and basically understand, is that customer going to be angry when they come in? <laughs> if so, there's also another tool that we we have where basically you can, you can kind of link it to your processes and you can say prioritize this ticket queue 
by a uh, sentiment. And then that way you can, you can help prioritize your, either your agent or if it's you, like you can help prioritize which ticket you need to reach out to, which customer you need to reach out to. So that's an example. I'm, I'm sure that most of our competitors have something like that, but absolutely you can. And I think that's a really interesting way to do it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Valerie, how do you encourage the right customer? If you, Ooh, uh, if you're a very small, I worked for a small company before, and I think one of the mistakes made was too much time and resources on the wrong customer. Customers who are more helpful in long-term goals than others. Oh, that's so, Valerie, you are. Okay, so here's the thing. If you figure out the perfect golden algorithm for finding the right customer, you should also sell that shit. There is no right algorithm, but I I, I think I understand what you're, what you're getting to. So um, I, I will answer this in, in terms of customer success because that's that's where I've been in the market for for about a decade now. Um, I think especially with customers that spend less with you, it's really easy to say, oh, well, they're just a small customer. But what I will also say is if you if you don't kind of grade on a curve of what is the potential of that customer, then you're going to miss out on some really fantastic customers and you're only going to serve the whales, the, those larger uh, customers that keep the lights on, they are important. However, growth over time is also important with the smaller ones. My recommendation, this is what I try to do in my own uh, organizations, is figure out what are the indicators of future growth. In your own product, what makes a super user? Think of the best customer you have right now what makes them so and what can you use in those those qualities and pinpoint in in your other customers and maybe even in your addressable market stop there but but feel free to reach out to me we can talk about this all day long yeah that's a really really great question ai can help with that as well but i will say that like you're going to want to understand that yourself um i would and then and then kind of kind of amplify it from there then Javier, from your experience, what parts of integrating AI into Zendesk have you enjoyed or used the most to help your clients? Uh, funny you should ask. If you ping me, I will send you a deck. Um, I presented on this a few months ago, and I've, I've done so a couple of times afterwards. I have a whole deck about um, what Tom Cruise taught our customers about AI. So for me, it's really important to understand what... Um, what who our customer base is um you, you probably already know but depending on like our if you're b2b if you serve b2b versus directly to customers your customers are going to have a different appetite for ai than others if you serve consumers directly don't tell them you're using ai they don't want that <laughs> they do not want that but you can leverage it in other ways across your customer journey. So send that to, if you, if you ping me, I will send that to you. But for me personally, I really enjoy when AI is used to make humans better. Bots, sure, that's great, but that's one little piece of the beginning of the customer journey. And there's so many more elements that, that uh, it can help you with. Uh, so, for example, sentiment analysis and also empowering you and your your agents, whoever's answering those tickets to know, like to be able to pull up examples and and knowledge of, of how to make something better. So those are my favorites. Um, but but there's a lot of them. So there's a lot of examples. So happy to happy to do that more. Um, yeah, I'll stop sharing. I know we're, we're over time, but uh if there's, let me check through the chat. Very cool. I see some folks on here. I'm going to get a transcript of this and any of these that I didn't get to answer, I will uh, I will do so. Uh, I will follow up to you. This is super, super cool. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time. Come find me online somewhere. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll keep it going. Have a good rest of your day. Enjoy the rest of the summit. Bye.